Hello, I'm Judith Hudson and I'd like first of all to thank you for giving our organisation the opportunity to present at this co-virtual conference today. I'm going to talk first a little bit about um, the Dear Dys Dyslexic Foundation that I'm representing, uh, then briefly what our, our mission is, uh, who we are and what we do, then outline some of the um, jurisdiction and administration systems that exist in Australia before looking at some of the laws, um, some subordinate laws and codes and guidelines that exist in Australia and under which dyslexia is placed. My affiliations, uh, briefly then, um, I'm an adjunct association at the University of Tasmania in Australia and a non-executive director of Australia's first not-for-profit charity that we support young people and adults with dyslexia. So we're the only adult organisation supporting dyslexia in Australia at all. Um, I don't have dyslexia myself, although the Dear Dyslexic Foundation is actually run mostly by dyslexics. It was set up by dyslexics uh, and it's about telling stories, as I explain in a moment. Um, I've worked in the field of dyslexia for many years in the UK and in Australia. I don't have dyslexia myself, but uh, I do have several members of the family um, and not least my husband who's dyslexic. Um, I've worked as a teacher, a psychologist, a researcher, writer, lecturer. I'm an advocate and uh, an activist to support greater recognition for dyslexia. Uh, and to actually campaign for earlier diagnosis and identification in Australia and more support because, um, as you will see as I go through, uh, things need to change quite a bit. Okay, Australia then came a bit late to the table. Um, the Dear Dyslexia Foundation was actually uh, formed by uh, or founded by our present CEO, um, Shay Russell, and Shay is herself dyslexic and a PhD student as well. Uh, she's almost completed, she's in the, the final rundown. Um, she started Dear Dyslexic because she wanted to empower adults that are dyslexic uh, and decided to do it through uh, telling stories. I've put the website um, reference here and I do recommend you to go and have a look at, at some of our um, podcasts. We deliver advocacy, we promote awareness about dyslexia, we give witness testimony, uh, we attend royal commissions and give evidence there. Uh, and where to date we actually submitted uh, three times, three uh, papers, um, one to the Dyslexia and Youth Correction Service in Victoria, um, one for a study into education in TAFE, which is Technical and Further Education Colleges, uh, and one more recently uh, into the Adult Literacy Inquiry in 2022. They've all been recorded in Hansard, um, they all, in a way, mark some progress in terms of getting dyslexia recognised a little more than it is at the moment. And if the recommendations that we make are adopted, um, we have no idea where they will be, when they will be, but, but that they are actually recorded as recommendations. Um, we wait to see, but we have made the recommendations and they are writ large. So. So what if is dyslexia then? Uh, it's a recognised condition globally. Um, it's a disability that affects some people, the ability to work with words and numbers. Um, it can be reading, writing, spelling, um, planning, writing, um, anything that involves language, written language. It can leave them very disadvantaged in a world of written language. We're a very literate society. Uh, and if you do have difficulties with, with literacy, you're dis disadvantaged. It's not an unusual condition. Um, it's recommended, for, uh, it's, it's numbers in terms of uh, prevalence, uh, not recommendations at all, but they are recorded around the world in different um, numbers. So it can be anything from 10% through to about 25%, depending on who's making the diagnosis, um, what tests they're using, 
uh, what systems, what categories, all sorts of things that can come to play. But most people say, or most countries will admit to having at least 10%. Uh, one of the other things is, is the quirks of dyslexia is actually seeing some of the things that you probably start might start recognizing as, as I sort of go through them that um, getting words mixed up uh, certainly when speaking aloud or, or speaking to an audience getting um, words that sound like the one you use being pulled out from the memory and it, it is not the word you want and can change and distort what you're saying completely confusing right and left and directional problems um, difficulties processing information and particular, particularly if speed is needed if you've got to think on the hoof as it were um, very disadvantaging to a dyslexic they need time to process information it's not their slow learners they're slow processors uh, suffering from brain feeds when you put it freeze when you put on the spot just the word that you want to say next has gone you've lost it uh, and this happens a lot with dyslexics in front of an audience Disorganisation, and that can be in personal disorganisation or work, um, school, in your life, organisation, personally, planning, uh, getting late for appointments, being late, being um, missing when you should be there, uh, turning up in the wrong place at the wrong time or the wrong day. Uh, systems that are, appear logical for solving problems to a dyslexic can appear to be very convoluted and very inefficient to someone who's not dyslexic, but they frequently work for the individual. And stronger knowledge is demonstrated when they're expressing it orally. Um, there's usually quite a, a discrepancy between what you see in their written language and what you hear when they're speaking orally. Okay, so negative economic and social consequences of dyslexic are well reported. Um, significant disadvantages, economic and social, because pre uh, education is frequently interrupted, or if it's not interrupted, it is actually um, misdiagnosed or misrecognised and children and end up in groups and sets that are not cognitively uh, on their level, but behaviourally they put in there because people find sometimes that it can be very difficult to cope with them in the class uh, and extremely vulnerable to the environment that is around them so if you put in a class of deviants and you're not a deviant yourself you soon will be <laughs> often help hampered by their communication difficulties so they not be able to express themselves properly it gets a lot of young people in, and adults into frustrating situations where they can usually get out of it by being uh, or appearing obnoxious um, and insulting to the speaker and, and sort of a complete breakdown in the communications happens because of this frustration that they haven't been able to express themselves in the way they want to. May have a lower life satisfaction so they frequently when their education is, is um, curtailed through the learning difficulties that they have they end up in a lower place than they should be in terms of social and economic climbing, in terms of occupations that they're going to be able to do, um, and as a consequence can have very much lower life satisfaction. Overall poor mental health can be at a disadvantage and well-being across their lifespan, frequently living with something that causes such frustration and such difficulty socially and emotionally eventually can cause an awful lot of psychosocial problems and it's this high percentage of dyslexics have the psychosocial disabilities um, this is seen as the sort of the the invisible dyslexia uh, and associated with many of the uh, the difficulties that in, in terms of citizenship and community skills that they frequently lack the workforce then must adapt to a complex environment with numerous demands uh, while receiving little or no support and this in itself can cause a lot of problems too. So looking at Australia, um, the administration uh, in Australia 
um, if you sort of think of the UK, the UK is made up of four different countries, so England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales, and each of those jurisdictions have their way of interpreting UK law. Uh, and Australia is no different. The jurisdictions in, in Australia are given to the six states, which are Queensland, uh, Western Australia, South Australia, New South Wales, uh, Victoria and Tasmania. Uh, and the two territories, which is Northern Territories and the um, administrative capital, uh, which is Canberra. Um, we are a signatures, signatories to um, various uh, conventions. Um, legislation goes from the central federal government or the Commonwealth government, as it's, it's sometimes called, uh, and each of the jurisdictions then interpret and apply rules or laws to their particular state or territory. Okay, so the legislation, these I've pulled out some, just some of the ones that are, are sort of, um, they were signatories to, uh, and some of the ones that are homegrown ones as well. Um, it was a founding member of the United Nations and back in 1945. Uh, we have the um, United Nations Conventions of the Right of Persons with Disabilities. Um, that one's got the guiding principles and policies for program um, development and principles of human rights. The uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, protecting um, equal basis for human rights across all states. Uh, we have the Disability Dis Inclusion Act, which is an Australian Act uh, formed in 2014. This one is going for um, aiming for uh, greater equity by including all people with disabilities in mainstream life. Uh, Disability Discrimination Act that was formed in 1992 and amended and revised in 2018. Uh, that's an Australian one. This uh, Disability Strategy. This strategy ran from 2011 to 2021, and as now we're into 21 to 31, a strategy that uh, recommendations of, of things that can be put in place in the environment, in the community, in each of the states or territories to include more people with disability in mainstream life. Then we have the Disability Standards in Education um, that was uh, put together in 2005 and reviewed again in 2021 with 13 recommendations for change on that one. This one affects all teachers and educators, training providers, uh, and it's a subordinate legislation, which means that it is still law, but it's a guidance law in terms of uh, applying um, to standards that teachers and educators must uphold by law within their institution or their practice, their professional practice. So dyslexia is a, a disability in Australia then. It, it is actually recognised as a disability under the, uh, the DDA, the 1992 DDA section F. Um, and you can find the reference to that if you go to the Australian Dyslexia Association uh, website, uh, which I've put the address up for you. Of all the neurodiverse and learning disabilities, uh, dyslexia is the most common one. That's not just in Australia, that's that is in uh, developed worlds, other developed countries as well. In Australia then we claim one to ten individuals has a learning disability and eight in ten individuals with a learning disability have dyslexia so it is definitely the most prominent. Disclosure is a huge issue in Australia. The figures may not include undisclosed or undiagnosed numbers. Uh, there are considerably more instances that go unrecorded because people do not disclose and I'll go into that a bit more. Uh, further on. The perceived consequences of disclosing that you've got dyslexia are too often the reality so people don't disclose because it leads them or can lead them open to ridicule, to lack of respect or trust, um, being seen as less than you were before you disclosed um, and at the worst possible it can actually 
lead to losing your job, losing your place on courses. So it's something that people with dyslexia may worry about sharing their diagnosis um, with potential employers. They must put off, they, they may put it off because that knowledge can lead to feeling of rejections uh, and a negative approach to, to job practice or job searching even. Uh, so it is, it is a problem and something that we desperately need to change. The youth justice system and young people involved in the, the justice system are more likely to present with conditions that have and do adversely expect, affect speech, language and communication development, um, more so than those not involved in the justice system. Speech and communication difficulties, literacy difficulties and language difficulties were the subject of two or three recent, more recent uh, studies um, and the the most, well the earliest one that was the most significant was uh, Pamela Snow and uh, Snow and Powell in 2008 where they found that 52% of young offenders were found to be language impaired in some way with many of these language impairments previously either an un unrecognised or unidentified. Uh, in Victoria, the, the one state alone, 40% of the juveniles in detention um, were found to have a learning disability affecting language, and that was in 2013. Uh, the SPICE project, which is um, South, uh, Speech Pathology Australia um, project, working with youth offenders at a, a college, um, Parkville College, which is within, within of one of the Victorian correctional establishments and working with um, SPA Speech Pathology Australia did a, a huge study looking at the, the impact if you like of uh, speech and communication difficulties and such studies that, that were done as of this one highlight very much the need to change that things do need to change. So Australia then is a signatory to the United Nations Convention and Rights of the Person with Disability, yes. Um, but it, it's difficult to see where they make the most or, or the least impact. Um, certainly some of the articles, they are, um, yes, uh, not as well... Um, not as high profile as others, I think is the best way to say it. <clears throat> if you look at this table here, this is from um, 2012, taking a, a number of uh, young people in the population and a, an equal number of young people that are in custody. And you can see the, the number of, of difficulties, dyslexia seems 43 to 57% more likely to be dyslexic in a, a youth an offending group. Uh, communication disorders, 60 to 90%. If you cannot communicate or understand what is being said to you through whatever means and not understanding the, the language or the, um, the legal jargonese, uh, strongly disadvantaged, not, not comprehending what's being said to them. Um, a lot of young people can agree to something that didn't put their hands up to, something that they did not do or did not know anything about, but they haven't understood the questions and, and they end up incriminated. So in the 2011 report uh, on the health and well-being of incarcerated adolescents, um, the Royal Australasian College of Physicians reported that 52% of young people suffer from three or more mental health problems and that's not including a conduct disorder. After excluding for a conduct disorder, up to 75% of these young people in detention fulfilled the cri criteria for one or more diagnosable, <coughs> excuse me, um, di diagnosable psychiatric disorders and these could include ADHD, autism, uh, mood and anxiety disorders, um, post-traumatic stress disorders, so um, a whole gamut of uh, conditions, disabilities and uh, difficulties unearthed within one population, one small population, when you consider the size of, 
um, a youth offending institute. Excuse me. Uh, the dear dyslexic then we made a make submissions as I said we've we've submitted three papers now for um consultation um initiatives but we made a submission to the the Parliament of Victoria to their legislative assembly um back in uh, November nineteen uh, twenty twenty sorry uh and we put forward various um features of, of the disadvantages of, of being dyslexic in the correctional services, um, reduced literacy or language, language competencies, and I highlighted just the last slide, uh, can frequently cause an awful lot of um, misunderstanding and miscommunication. It makes young people more vulnerable towards criminal and deviant activities and many young people with, with dyslexia are prominently young males of course, um, are incarcerated within the detention centres. So what, what we maintain in, in the evidence that we put forward in our recommendations, we strongly recommend that training programmes for tutors within such establishments should be offered to ensure that the right ideas and strategies are part of the tutor training. If the tutors are not informed about dyslexia or the difficulties that are associated with dyslexia, you've got a complete mismatch of student, uh, tutor, um, and the chances of being a successful interaction are going to be pretty remote. So, advocacy and evidence are the role of the support group. Um, we raise awareness about dyslexia, we make submissions, we make representations, we make our voice heard as much as possible. Reliable professional witnesses is what we try to be um, and advocacy support. We do a lot of support. We used to have or we have a, a phone line help um, just giving advice or um, support or direction to um, callers who are um, having difficulties because of their dyslexia. We try to give dyslexia a louder voice in Australia. We make recommendations on behalf of those with dyslexia. We'll fight for legal recognition of dyslexia as a disability and funded assessments being able to be accessed by individuals with learning difficulties or the could be or have, would be identified as dyslexia through the National Insurance Disability Scheme. That is one of our strongest recommendations. So many people cannot afford to have um, a full assessment. Uh, they cannot afford to go through a full psychological battery of testing to find out if they are dyslexic or not. So a number of people who are dyslexic will never be recognised by such as such um, because they don't get an assessment. If we could actually have a funded assessment or the availability of, of getting some support towards an assessment, that would be a major, major breakthrough for, for Australia. Disability inclusive and equality. Yes, the laws exist to promote equity and to promote equity in education and employment and should safeguard legislative obligations. Anti-discrimination legislation, and it, it can offer some redress that even anyone that believes they've been discriminated against, be it in um, socially, uh, in education or in employment, um, if they have been actually discriminated and um, found wanting, then um, yes, the issue is addressed, but there are no, an apology would be acceptable, but there's no um, fines, there's no uh, <clears throat> no incentives really to, to go to court. Um, disability legislation in Australia, it doesn't exempt, extend the same powers as in the UK or the USA, and at best it serves only as a prohibiting active discrimination. Um, it, it serves as best 
we know the laws are there, uh, how many people understand the full extent of them and how many of them actually comply with them uh, is a, a whole different situation. But with insufficient clarity around learning disapproachability, um, one of the problems in Australia is there's so many different words or terms for dyslexia and learning disability or learning difficulty um, are just two of them. Or even establish that the nature of an individual's difficulties concur with the, the World Health Organization terminology of disability, where we haven't, we haven't even got clarity on that in Australian law. So actions are, are rarely demonstrated in, through the Australian courts. So there remains much to do, both dyslexia and dyslexia laws in Australia um, do need to improve, but things are changing. They, we have done more, we've seen more changes in the last 20 years than in the last, in the previous 30. Um, as I said, dyslexia, uh, Australia were late coming to the table with dyslexia and they lagged behind other developed English speaking um, countries. But the changes that are happening and people like uh, Shay, uh, we our CEO, and the groups like the Dear Dyslexia um, Foundation, um, the Code Red, another activist group in Australia, uh, the Square Pegs, uh, an action group in Tasmania, Things will change because people are getting more and more informed. Um, we have to change the way we educate our teachers. We have to change the way um, that we train our teachers and and continue with professional development so that that training is ongoing as more information about things like dyslexia and other neurodiverse disabilities um, are coming on more evidence-based um, teachers have got to have more access to that throughout their, their careers, not just when they're being trained. The changes may be small, uh, and in some places they're barely discernible, but the changes are going in the right direction. And we live in hope that what we're doing um, will gain strength and purchase, and over the next few years we'll see Australia really coming to the fore in terms of and um, the legal situation regarding dyslexia. So thank you very much for listening. Goodbye.